What happens when a justice votes at conference to rule contrary to the majority, but because of some historical accident, there's no written dissent? It might seem like a trivial matter, but the entire trajectory of history can be changed. In this episode, we'll tell the story of three people who, in their heyday, were some of the most famous people in the country. A chief justice, his daughter, and a trailblazing entrepreneur whose lawsuit made it all the way to the Supreme Court. All three are largely forgotten today, but things might have played out differently if one justice hadn't been too sick to write a dissent. I'm Elizabeth Slattery. And I'm Anastasia Bowden. This week on DIST, we're taking on Browell versus Illinois. The court's decision is indefensible. I respectfully dissent. Because the majority in this case has not done what a court of law must do, I respectfully dissent. For these reasons and others elaborated, in my opinion, I respectfully dissent. We respectfully dissent. I respectfully dissent. I respectfully dissent. I dissent. Dissents don't make law. They're the losing side. But one thing they do is tell stories. And in doing so, they help to vindicate the loser. If not in the Supreme Court, then at least in the court of history. Dissents give context. They point out flaws in the majority. And they preserve another side of the tale in the history books. They tell the story that was left untold by the majority. I'm reminded of something Justice Sonia Sotomayor wrote in Manhattan Community Access Corporation. This was a case about whether public access television channels are state actors, making them subject to the First Amendment's free speech clause. Justice Sotomayor disagreed with the majority's holding that the public access channel in that case was not a state actor. But here's how she begins her dissent. She says... The court tells a very reasonable story about a case that is not before us. I write to address the one that is. So what happens when a justice votes a dissent, but the dissent and its story goes unwritten, as happened in the case of Bradwell versus Illinois? Bradwell was an 1873 case that asked whether the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment protected a woman's right to practice law. The case links three characters we'll explore in this episode. Salmon Portland Chase, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court when Bradwell was argued, Kate Chase, the daughter of the Chief Justice and one of the most famous political and social figures in the country at that time, and Myra Bradwell, the publisher of a prominent legal journal and a leading advocate for women's equality. When you ask people about famous suffragettes, you'll hear names like Susan B. Anthony or Elizabeth Cady Stanton or Ida B. Wells, but you don't often hear the name Myra Bradwell. Well, let me tell you. Myra Browell was incredible. Myra set out to study law as a shared pursuit with her husband, James. She once said that if husband and wife worked side by side and thought side by side, we would need no divorce courts. We can debate the merits of that statement, but the point is that Myra studied law alongside her husband while also pursuing a career of her own as a publisher and editor of the Chicago Legal News, a highly influential weekly legal journal. Myra built the Chicago Legal News from the ground up, and this was no easy task. She had to lobby the state legislature for an exemption from laws that at the time prevented married women from having certain legal rights, such as the right to enter into contracts. But once she got up and started, her rise was meteoric. Myra was able to negotiate with the Illinois legislature to print the statutes past each term and to have her journal serve as legal proof of a law's existence. She then negotiated agreements with various courts, including the Supreme Court and every federal court, to print case opinions as they were released. At one point, she sold templates for legal documents that she drafted herself, and later she got into the business of printing legal briefs. For those in the legal community, she was basically above the law, Westlaw, and Cockle in one. Beyond being a tremendous entrepreneur, Myra was fiery, witty, and clever. She used to write columns for her paper, often advocating for women's equality. In one column, she remarked that if women wanted to practice law in certain states, they should just disguise themselves as men because brains and mentality were apparently measured by the mere wearing of apparel. She said elsewhere, We claim that women have the right to think and act as individuals. If the great father had intended it to be otherwise, he would have placed Eve in a cage and given Adam the key. When a judge said that women weren't allowed to be attorneys because they might practice in front of their husbands who could be the judge, Myra argued that this meant that all men should be disqualified from being attorneys because they might practice before their fathers. 
When a court denied a woman the ability to become barred as an attorney because it said it had to follow the immemorial standards of England, Myra wrote that if that were true, then all Americans should be practicing in wigs. Myra was pretty famous. For a time, the Chicago Legal News was the most widely circulated legal journal in the country, and she was a key player in the equality movement. She was also friendly with Mary Todd Lincoln. After Mary Todd was institutionalized by her son under deeply unfair circumstances, it was behind closed doors without notice or testimony from Mrs. Lincoln herself, Myra secured her release. In gratitude, Mary Todd gave Myra the pen used by Lincoln to sign the Emancipation Proclamation. Despite Bradwell having years of legal training and running one of the most popular legal journals in the country, the Illinois Bar refused to issue her a license to practice law because she was a woman. So naturally, Bradwell sued, although someone else had to represent her. And her case eventually made it all the way to the Supreme Court. Let's introduce character number two, Kate Chase. Kate Chase was the daughter of Chief Justice Salmon P. Chase, but was well known in her time as one of DC's best political masterminds. Kate's mother died when she was young, so Kate grew up as her father's confidant in the most prominent social and political circles in Washington. As a teenager, Kate began hosting elegant parties at the family's home in Washington, and important political figures, including President Lincoln, often attended. It was said the young Kate solicited the envy of First Lady Mary Todd Lincoln. There's even a book about this called Mrs. Lincoln's Rival. She sounds like she would have been perfect for the Real Housewives of D.C., 19th century edition. Here's one of her biographers on this purported rivalry. My name is John Aller. I'm a retired lawyer and current author of books mostly about American history, and I've written a book that was published in 2014 called American Queen, The Rise and Fall of Kate Chase Sprague. Sam and Chase having no wife, but having Kate as his eldest daughter, she was kind of the counterpart of Mary Lincoln. Put it this way, Sam and Chase always felt that he would have made a better president than Lincoln, and I think he made no bones about that, and Lincoln knew that. I think Kate felt that she would have been a better first lady than Mary Lincoln. And I don't know whether she was very politic and keeping that to herself. But, you know, it was it was also a contrast. Mary Lincoln was older. She was kind of short and not particularly well proportioned. Kate was this tall, thin, young, beautiful, you know, 21, 22 year old woman. And so it would be natural for Mary to feel some jealousy of Kate. Kate was ambitious, outgoing, funny, smart, a keen political strategist, and beautiful. And she quickly rose alongside her father in D.C.'s political ranks. Here's Aller again. She was more famous for being famous in her time than she was for actually doing anything. Arguably, she didn't have any really tangible accomplishments that you can point to that would make her fame lasting. Her fame was more from her own persona. The way you were describing her, you know, famous for being famous. It's almost like uh, the world's first uh, Kim Kardashian or something. But yeah, kind of. <laughs> yeah. I think she had more substance than a lot of the famous people famous for being famous, you know, say a Paris Hilton type. She lived in a time when there weren't that many outlets for women in terms of professional accomplishments. She couldn't run for office. She couldn't even vote. You know, the most famous women from that century, the 19th century, are generally the first ladies. You know, the Dolly Madisons, the Mary Lincolns, Martha Washington. So she never quite became a first lady. So what does that leave other than the fame she had, you know, sort of at the time as a as a socialite and political hostess? Kate's father, various congressmen and even President Lincoln came to Kate for political advice. Kate was so well known and respected that she would even visit battle camps of Union Army divisions and meet with generals to offer them her thoughts about the war. Here's Aller. Practically every general that came down the pike, um, if they if they were on good terms with her father, um, she would, you know, befriend them and visit them and counsel them. Uh, an example of one she did not was McClellan, who was 
her father couldn't stand and vice versa. So she had no influence on him. But she also uh, counseled um, uh, a powerful senator, Roscoe Conkling, uh, James G. Blaine, the um, Republican candidate for president, Chester Arthur, a few others. If you were anybody or in Washington, most likely she knew you and had met you. Um, she knew every president from, I think, from either Pierce or Buchanan, maybe all the way up to McKinley or at least uh, Grover Cleveland. She was very politically astute. Despite marrying William Sprague, who was the governor of Rhode Island, later a U.S. senator, and the richest man in the country, Kate was more famous. Their wedding was the social event of the season, and she single-handedly ran her father's presidential campaign. But because she was a woman, Kate wasn't allowed on the floor at the Republican National Convention, so she lobbied for votes and held meetings from the balcony. Saying she was famous is an understatement. Yet today, you'd never know it. Mine was the first full biography in probably 40 years. Uh, she is kind of not that well remembered today, even though she was, as you say, probably one of the most famous people in America, most famous women in America during the Civil War and the post-war era. I would say she was, you know, kind of a Jackie Kennedy, Jackie Onassis type person in, in fame and popularity. I don't know about popularity, but, but in fame. And then she just kind of faded away. Last but not least, Salmon P. Chase. Who is Salmon P. Chase, you may ask? Only one of the most important men of the Civil War era. Check out this bio. Anti-slavery lawyer, co-founder of the Liberty, Free Soil, and Republican parties, governor of Ohio, U.S. Senator, presidential hopeful and political rival of Lincoln, Treasury Secretary, and eventually Chief Justice of the United States. He's the man who lends his name to Chase Bank. Whose face graced the first $1 bill? Salmon's. And Chase didn't get there by accident. He got there because he was ambitious. Here's one of his biographers. My name is Walter Starr. I'm a lawyer and an author, more of an author these days than a lawyer. Um, I've written three books all about lawyers. <laughs> And I'm currently working on a biography of Sam and Chase. You know, if you got a bunch of Civil War historians together and sort of played the game of, you know, throw out a name and then, you know, a one word reaction to it, if you threw out the name Sam and Chase, their one word reaction would be ambitious. And yes, you know, he was. There's no question. You don't become Chief Justice of the United States without a certain amount of ambition and, and energy and diligence and luck. But those who denigrate him for that, I think, need to put themselves in his shoes in 1841. Um, he is a member of the city council of Cincinnati, a promising young lawyer, uh, a Whig, one of the two major parties. And if he just kind of stayed put in the Whig party, his chances of you know, much higher office looked great. But instead, he leaves the Whig party and joins the Liberty Party. Now, the Liberty Party in the prior election won fewer votes than the Green Party or the Libertarians won in 2016. So imagine a, you know, a prominent Democratic politician or Republican who leaves their party to join, say, the Libertarians. Would you call that person ambitious? No, you would call them odd or eccentric or idealistic, but you would not call them ambitious because... This was not the obvious path to political power, but that is the path that he pursued in the 1840s and 1850s, kind of turning this tiny little group of anti-slavery activists into bigger and bigger parties that ultimately become the Republican Party that wins the election of 1860. The takeaway is that Salmon P. Chase was an ambitious but principled man, and he was never afraid to stand up for what he thought was right. He moved to Ohio as a young man to pursue a career in the law and immediately became an ally to the anti-slavery cause. He was a tall, imposing man with broad shoulders. Legend has it he once stood in the doorway of a hotel threatened by rioters. I think this was during race riots in Cincinnati in the late 1830s. And Chase single-handedly held the doors shut, keeping the mob out. Who are you? asked one. You will suffer for this, said another. Chase responded coolly. I can be found anytime. 
Here's Walter Starr. Abraham Lincoln supposedly said, this is one of those Abraham Lincoln quotes that I'm not quite sure about, but he supposedly said that, that, you know, Chase is about one and a half times as big as any other man I know. And he was literally physically big. I mean, he was about mm, six, two, six, and not, he was not quite as tall as Abraham Lincoln, but he was, when he walked into the room, you know, and he was tall and, and solidly built, you know, he was a presence. Karl Schurz, the German-American uh, general and then political leader, um, said something to the effect that, you know, no man looked as much like a great man as Sam and Chase. As an attorney, Chase earned the nickname the Attorney General of Runaway Slaves, a badge he wore with honor. He firmly believed that the Constitution was an anti-slavery document, and he argued against fugitive slave laws in courts and against the expansion of slavery in politics. As a senator, he would later say that he could not countenance a law which punishes humanity as a crime. Chase was a tireless advocate for freedom. He went toe-to-toe with slavery defender John C. Calhoun in the Senate, writing a manifesto with his good friend Charles Sumner to defeat Calhoun's proposal to extend slavery into Nebraska. After his tenure as senator, Chase became governor of Ohio, and after that, he was a contender for the Republican nomination for president. The nomination wound up going to Lincoln, but ever the gentleman, the next day, Chase was out there stumping for Lincoln. Here's Walter Starr. You know, in 1860, when, again, he has quite good chances, but Lincoln gets it. You know, he doesn't sort of go off into a corner and sulk and pout. No, he, like, the day after Lincoln gets the nomination, there's this huge event in Columbus, and he's the principal speaker, and he says, well, we are going to fight, and we are going to win this election for Lincoln and for free. And he goes around the country giving speeches for Lincoln. Now, that doesn't happen much today. I mean, you know, in either party. Well, I guess to some extent this year, um, Uh, Sanders has given a few speeches for Biden, but it doesn't happen all that often that a disappointed presidential candidate kind of devotes the next six months of his life to getting his rival elected. Because of Chase's loyalty and political popularity, Lincoln nominated him as Secretary of the Treasury, where he helped finance the war effort. The first piece of U.S. federal currency was printed under Secretary Chase and bore his portrait. Though Chase's most prestigious position, Chief Justice of the United States, would come after this moment in history, according to Walter Starr, this is where Chase's legacy peaked. I think he would be an important figure in American history if he had died on the day that he started work at the Treasury Department in 1861. That really his most important contributions are before he becomes Treasury Secretary and before he becomes Chief Justice. Not to Not to belittle what he does in those two roles, but really the building the sort of anti-slavery movement, I think is, if you have to name one thing, is the one thing that he accomplishes. Professor Randy Barnett of Georgetown University Law Center, a Chase aficionado in his own right, agrees. He is terribly, terribly unjustly neglected for the role he played, not as the chief justice, which was kind of his reward for a life of being an anti-slavery advocate for everything he did up until the time he became chief justice. Um, He's just a figure that deserves to be extremely well known. He also developed the theory that animated first the liberty, then the free soil and the Republican party, then finally the Republican parties, the constitutional platforms of all three parties that basically uh, said that slavery under the constitution was a purely local institution. And nationally, the Constitution adopted a regime of freedom, and the Constitution did not adopt the concept of property in man, and expressly did not adopt that. Pro- and even though the even though Justice Taney said it did, Justice Taney was wrong. And yet, Chase is largely forgotten, even when it comes to his achievements as an anti-slavery advocate. Here's Walter Starr again. There have been in recent years, you know, thick biographies of Frederick Douglass, of Garrison, of I mean, even some, you know, much more obscure abolitionists like the Grimke sisters have had, you know, you know, solid books written about them. Chase gets a little less play, I think, because he's less radical than any of those people. I mean, you know, Garrison famously burns a copy of the Constitution at one public rally. Chase's great contribution was to say, no, no, don't burn the Constitution. The Constitution is, when read properly, an anti-slavery document. 
you know, he instinctively understands you're not going to make abolition or anti-slavery a powerful movement if you go around burning the Constitution. Americans love the Constitution. But if you can tell them that, that they can love the Constitution and hate slavery at the same time, well, then they'll, you know, they'll join you. And that's what, you know, thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people did in the years before the Civil War was, you know, in bits and pieces, join the Free Soil Party and then the Republican Party as a way of expressing their anti-slavery. I can't even tell you how much it speaks to me because I think that debate is sort of having a resurgence, you know, whether to sort of like burn everything down or or whether we should believe in American ideals um, when read right. properly. It, 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 pre pre precisely. I mean, his he, he was not in favor of burning everything down. Um, he was in favor of embracing the Constitution. His view was that you could and should embrace the Constitution, embrace the Declaration of Independence, and use those to achieve change. He believed that he would, you know, see the end of slavery in his lifetime, which, again, in 1840 seemed absurd, but it happened. Lincoln eventually appointed Chase to be Chief Justice. And even though he's not an exceptionally well-known justice, in his time, he was one of the most widely known men in the country including at the time when Bradwell versus Illinois came before the Supreme Court. And that brings us to Bradwell, which was argued in January 1873. So what happened at the Supreme Court? Myra was represented at the court by Matthew Carpenter, a politician, lawyer, and advocate for equal rights. He took on Myra's case for free, and he argued that the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment protected Myra Bradwell's constitutional right to earn a living, and that right was being impermissibly infringed by Illinois. An interesting tidbit here is that Bradwell was argued around the same time as the slaughterhouse cases. That involved a challenge brought by a group of butchers to a law that granted a monopoly over slaughterhouse operations to one operator in New Orleans and ordered all the others to close. The butchers argued that the monopoly would deprive them of their right to earn a living. The government argued that the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment didn't protect that right. And who was the lawyer for the government in that case? None other than Matthew Carpenter. Here's Walter Starr. In today's environment, that, that just wouldn't happen. But, you know, some... some eager young lawyer would write to Myra Bradwell and say, look, I know that, you know, Senator Carpenter is a famous Supreme Court lawyer, but you really don't want him arguing your case. I'll take it pro bono. And, you know, I mean, wouldn't be even some eager young lawyer. It would be like the Supreme Court law clinic at Stanford would say, hey, we'll take your case and get you out of this, this issue conflict. Carpenter realized that people saw the fight for equal economic rights for women as a stepping stone to equal voting rights for women. And he knew that the fear of women's suffrage might hurt Bradwell's chance of winning at the court. Thus, despite being a personal proponent of women's suffrage, he argued in court that his claim was really limited and that it had nothing to do with suffrage. This eventually earned both him and Myra the ire of Susan B. Anthony, who thought Carpenter didn't go far enough. Carpenter argued that the 14th Amendment, quote, opens to every citizen of the United States, male or female, black or white, married or single, honorable professions, such as the practice of law. And no citizen can be excluded from any one of them. Intelligence, integrity, and honor are the only qualifications that can be prescribed as conditions. True, he said, women might be more or less frequently retained than men, but that should be determined by the market, not by law. The state of Illinois didn't even bother sending opposing counsel, which had an interesting consequence. Here's Walter Starr. The case was moot by the time the Supreme Court issued its opinion. Um, it, um, it's not just that Illinois passed a statute soon thereafter. The statute had been on the books for a year plus um, a, that would have allowed her to kind of refile her application and but because Illinois didn't bother to hire a lawyer, there, there was nobody to, to sort of send the one-page letter to the justices to say, oh, you know, just calling to your attention this, you know, recent statue of the state of Illinois, which moots the case, please dismiss. Um, 
And uh, so, you know, the, there's no way in today's environment that the justices would ever have written any opinions in the case. Um, but I didn't want to give a whole paragraph to a mootness issue that's only going to be of interest to you. <laughs> it is interesting to me because I'm a constitutional lawyer and uh, yeah, the government would not hesitate to, to try to get my case dismissed if it was moot. So despite being moot, the case was decided anyway. The case came out 8-1. In the majority opinion, Justice Samuel F. Miller ruled against Myra Bradwell on the basis that the Privileges or Immunities Clause only protected rights inheriting from federal citizenship. And the right to earn a living, he said, was not one of them. He cited the court's opinion issued the day before in the slaughterhouse cases, which came out against the butchers on the same reasoning. Unlike Bradwell, which was an 8-1 decision, Slaughterhouse was decided 5-4, with four justices, including Chase, dissenting based on their view that the Privileges or Immunities Clause of the 14th Amendment protected the right to earn a living. Why didn't they dissent in Bradwell? Well, women are different. Here's how Justice Joseph Bradley, who dissented in Slaughterhouse but concurred in Bradwell, explained it. The natural and proper timidity and delicacy which belongs to the female sex evidently unfits it for many of the occupations of life. The family institution is repugnant to the idea of a woman adopting a distinct and independent career from that of her husband. Sounds like stereotypes masquerading as constitutional law to me. In what has become perhaps the most often quoted line from the Bradwell case, Justice Bradley said, The paramount destiny and mission of woman are to fulfill the noble and benign offices of wife and mother. The only man who voted consistently in both Slaughterhouse and Bradwell was Salmon P. Chase. He dissented in both and would have ruled for the plaintiffs in both. But after suffering a series of strokes, Chase was too ill to muster a written opinion. It's said that on the last day of the term, he handed his duties as chief justice over to one of the other justices and sat with his head in his hands. He would die just weeks later. So the fact that he dissented is recorded, but we're left wondering why he voted that way. I asked some Chase aficionados why they thought Chase dissented. As Walter Starr noted, he had a history of advocating for women's rights. I found a newspaper article about a year before the Bradwell case in which he's quoted in the papers advocating votes for women. And this quote is printed in lots of papers and indeed continues to be printed all through the 19th century as women fight for votes. You know, in the late 1890s, you know, little newspapers in Kansas would reprint this quote of Chase talking about how, in his view, uh, votes for women would be good for women, it would be good for men, it would be good for elections, it would be good for the country. It was a very, you know, snappy little quote. And according to John Aller, it might have been driven at least in part due to his love and respect for his daughter, Kate. Chase's dissent as the sole dissent was probably influenced by his belief in the wisdom, equality, whatever you want to call it, of women in general. I think he I think he respected women. He wanted an education for Kate. She got a very good education. I, I think I think he was, you know, sort of a feminist. He was kind of old fashioned in his ways with in dealing personally with women, perhaps. But but at least philosophically, I think he was of a basically feminist bent. And I think a lot of that probably came from his daughters observing them and their talents. I think he saw women in general as equal. He viewed them as different, you know, different kind of creatures. But 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 he legally, I think he viewed them as as equals as in the same way he viewed uh, you know, slaves and African-Americans as equals. But without language to pour over or to instruct future generations or to memorialize or to defend his reasoning, we don't know exactly why he dissented. And Chase's heroic act of being the only dissenting justice in the Brabel case has been largely forgotten by history. I don't think many people know that Chase Bank refers to Salmon P. Chase, heroic anti-slavery advocate, senator, governor, Supreme Court justice. I don't think people know the name Salmon P. Chase at all. Maybe they would if they had learned in history classes or law school that he was the only dissenting vote to vindicate equality of the sexes in the Bradwell case. Thoughts As it happened, uh, Anastasia, I, I literally wrote that sentence 
in the book before you contacted me, like within a couple weeks. I, I had written a sentence in the book along that, those lines saying that the concurring opinion in Bradwell was quoted, and indeed is still quoted sometimes as an example of the kind of misogynistic thinking of the time. You know, you know women, you know, their, their role is in the kitchen and the, the drawing room, but not in the courtroom. So if he had written his dissenting opinion to take on not only the majority, but if he'd also written something to take on that, you know, kind of very limited vision of what women can accomplish in America, you know, that might well have been one of those dissents, like a, a Holmes dissent that gets, as you say, gets big play in the con- constitutional law books even today. No disrespect to others who have served as chief justice, but aside from William Howard Taft, Chase just might have the most impressive career, and yet he's nearly forgotten today. The same goes for the legacy of Myra Bradwell, an extraordinary character in her own right. After she lost her case, Myra continued to fight for women's rights and help other women win the ability to work in the courtroom, or wherever they pleased. But despite her valiant work for women her entire life, her Supreme Court case would arguably be the biggest shot she would have to change the trajectory of the law. That she lost didn't preclude her legacy, but having no dissent in her favor may have. And so too Kate Chase. She divorced her husband, who by then had lost most of his fortune, and moved with her daughters into a house her father had purchased before he died. A few years later, Kate became a recluse after her son committed suicide. She eventually died penniless in 1899. If Salmon had written a brilliant dissenting opinion in Bradwell, might scholars have dived deeper into his relationship with Kate? And might her memory have been preserved? History is complicated. And there are certainly other explanations for why Salmon P. Chase is relatively unknown today. Here's John Aller. I think one of the reasons for his lack of legacy today is he suffers in comparison to Lincoln. Lincoln is remembered as a warm man of the people and Salmon P. Chase not so much. He was not a very warm and fuzzy politician, not, not, not folksy like Lincoln. And here's Randy Barnett. And I think the reason he's not well known is because uh, the history of our country got rewritten by Southern sympathizers um, after the Civil War. And they basically threw into the trash everybody who had anything to do um, with Reconstruction um, or even anti-slavery at that time. Everybody got marginalized. It wasn't until the 1970s with the work of people like Eric Foner uh, that the memory of all of these people started to become revived one at a time. I mean, President Grant is known, what is he known as? A, a, a drunkard uh, who was ahead of a corrupt administration, rather than one of the, great, the greatest general in the history of the United States, um, and, a, and a president who fought for civil rights as long as he was a president, and put the Ku Klux Klan out of business uh, with his Department of Justice. He's not known for any of those things, because he, like Chase, like the, all of them, like John Bingham, like all of the rest of them, they were just dumped on. Uh, by a pro-Southern reading of of history uh, that became popular in the 20th century. Well, and the other reason is he couldn't write his his Bradwell descent, right? <laughs> That's the other reason he's not. And that is and that is the other reason. Had he <laughs> had he only been able to do that, then every all of history would have changed. History, it said, is written by the victors, but at the Supreme Court, that's just not true. Oftentimes, it's written by the dissents. Thanks for listening to DIST. Please subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. We'd appreciate your feedback, so send questions, comments, or ideas for future episodes to dist at pacificlegal.org. And if you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a five-star rating and tell your friends to check out DIST. Um, okay, well, I didn't warn you about this, so no pressure to answer, but we're also doing an episode on Salmon P. Chase, sort of. We're doing salmon P. Chase. Yeah, yeah, my man. I almost always, when I read, you know, someone else's biography, say, well, I could do a little better there, I could do a little better there. He joked that he had 
he had put the faces of more important people on the higher denomination bills and put his own face on the lowest as the sort of least in the hierarchy. I think, yeah, right. Uh, Well, maybe it's just a testament to how illustrious all of your former students are. I think that's what it is. My former students, uh, there's, there's, there's infinite potential there in my former students. They're going to eventually rule the world. We need, we need, actually, we should be doing this at 5 p.m. with a glass of wine. We might have <laughs> little, the little slatteries running around yelling in the background, but. Mom, I want to see who you're talking to. Who's that? Who's that, Mom? Does my voice sound like kind of gravelly? Not in a bad way. I think you have a beautiful podcast voice. Mm, thank you. <coughs> but I like I'm like I think you have a beautiful podcast voice. <coughs> okay. I do what I can.